Hi, everyone, and I'd like to welcome everyone here. And I'd also like to welcome Rand as my guest for the Ins Inspiring Entrepreneurs series. And the purpose of the Inspiring Entrepreneurs series is to share with other entrepreneurs, no matter what size they are, what this journey is like. Because typically, the journey of an entrepreneur is a roller coaster ride. And I am a firm believer that that's not necessary. If someone has been there before, there's got to be a map. And this, as I was just saying to Rand just a second ago, this dovetails perfectly into his book because as he sedates in the first part of his book, there's a cheat code to starting a business and he wants to share it. Okay, so what I'd like to do is Rand, let me tell you a little bit about Rand and I'll also let Rand introduce himself. The reason that I reached out to Rand is because he wrote well, I'm aware of Rand for a very long time. And the reason that I'm aware of Rand for a couple of reasons, which is many people have, is his Whiteboard Friday series and for Moz, but also the fact that he has taken something that scares people, which is technology, and he's added something very human to that. And one of the things that I've always noticed about you is, and I've worked with technology companies, and we know lots of things that we say about technology companies, <laughs> but what I've noticed is, you move between technology and understanding patterns and how to cheat algorithms and overcome obstacles and bring it into a very, very human, and for me as a marketer, a wonderfully human context for everybody else. And you broke the mold with that when you started. Um, and you continued to do that. And I think that's kind of be a mark of who you are as a person and an entrepreneur. And that is why I wanted to talk to you, because I like that combination. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate you having me on the program. Yeah, you're very welcome. So why don't you introduce yourself, Rand? Sure. Uh, so Go ahead. I'm, uh, I'm Rand Fishkin. I um, am probably best known as the founder of Moz, which is a software startup here in Seattle, Washington, that has tens of thousands of customers and about $50 million a year of revenue and maybe around 160 employees. Uh, I started that as a blog initially in 2003 and then transformed that into a consulting company and then into a product company, raised a few rounds of venture capital, uh, was the CEO for a long time and then stepped down a few years ago uh, and just left that company mm -hmm. in February and have started a new company called SparkToro. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm also the co-founder of Inbound.org uh, and I do a lot of speaking and traveling uh, all around the world, including uh, a number of events uh, in, in Ireland over the years and uh, a bunch in the UK and Europe. Um, and, uh, and of course, I have a, a new book out, <laughs> Boston <laughs> Founder, a uh, painfully honest field guide to the startup world. And um, yeah, it's been fun sort of getting that, getting that story told and having that catharsis of, you know, getting thousands of people to, to read about it and, um, and empathize and also hopefully get a lot of uh, a lot of tactical value from the yeah. things that that I went through that we went through as well as to your point feeling like they're not alone yes right that uh, that we all um, entrepreneurs almost universally uh, struggle mentally and emotionally um, and many of us physically and mm -hmm. uh, that that we are not the way you know people like Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk are portrayed that you know, have no weaknesses and focus only on the business and have this, you know, sort of odd, geeky, hyper-masculinity that um, can can come off as, as very inhuman. Uh, but then, in fact, most of us are people and most of us fail. Most of us fail pretty hard, right? The survival well, rates for a tech startup let's are... Let's take a moment. Low. Let's take a moment for that one. Because what I'd like to do, because by way of encouragement for people... You started very small. You started a business with your mom, which yeah. is already amazing, okay? But you started a simple services businesses in web, web development. So um, tell us a little bit about that really quickly, because I know I want to move you through each stage, but I'd like, I think it's really interesting for people to know you can start this small and grow to where you've gotten to. Well, I mean, we started negative. <laughs> so... I dropped out of college in 2001 and started working with my mom, Jillian, who's the co-founder of Moz. Yeah. And uh, we, over the next four years, accumulated almost half a million dollars of credit card debt, uh, mm -hmm. credit card and bank loans and 
um, some equipment loans and other stuff. But uh, you know, it got so bad that you'll you can read about it in the first chapter of the book. We had you know debt collectors coming after us, uh, which Baby is guys with tattoos. Yeah. So um, over the course of the next you know few years, as as I built that that uh, SEO Moz blog, and we transitioned to be an SEO consulting company. We were able to dig ourselves out of that debt and pay it back, but uh, it was definitely an extremely hard. You know, but what was interesting six, for seven me, years? What was interesting for me in reading about this is that the trigger to move you out of that space was something was a blog was something that you were passionate about and you wanted to do different, and it was a sideline project. Yeah, and that for me because. When I work with clients and when I work with people, and even in my own experience as an entrepreneur, I find that things emerge as you take each step forward that are indicators of where the most obvious step is. I mean, I'm, I'm a marketing strategist, so I believe in vision and taking, you know, what are the actions you take to bring the vision to reality? But there is a part of that journey that has to be about listening and watching. And I love that you moved the business from where it was, which was service-based, and something that you tried and that there was a glimmer there of something that you could explore that then transformed your company. Yeah. What made you realize that this was something that could move? Um, well, our, a lot of our web design and development clients and traditional marketing clients had trouble paying their bills and we had trouble mm -hmm. getting them to, uh, to, to close, to sign. Um, and in SEO, it was the opposite. You know, we were finding that all of our customers were actually paying their bills on time and you know, they were seeking us out. We didn't have to go pitch them. Uh, so I think that, that combined with the fact that we had all this debt and that any dollars coming in the door we were just desperate for, that's really what, what led us. Yeah. Um, so to, your, to customers, your customers taught you where you should be. Yeah, well, and I think you know, it, it is almost definitely the case that there were plenty of customers that we could have gotten in this other sector. It's not like, you know, web design and development went away. In fact, I would say it was probably a much bigger industry mm. than SEO was. I think that the reality was just that we were providing unique value. We were standing out in the SEO field and we were nobody special, nobody interesting in, in this other field. But you were somebody special and somebody interesting because you were you were doing something different. Uh, I mean, uh, in web design and development, I'm, no, but in I'm, SEO, I'm you honest, were doing, I don't think we were doing anything special in SEO. You were doing something different. In SEO, in SEO, we were doing, SEO something you were doing something different because you weren't hiding the knowledge. That's exactly right. Yep. Yeah. I think, uh, the reason, you know, the reason for the naming convention, SEO Moz is because Moz harkened back to this sort of open source movement, right? Making everything open and available, transparent and accessible. And I wanted to do that for the SEO world, which has always been very closed and insular up until that point. And that, that is certainly attracted a lot of customers for us. And to come back to my description of you, right? You had this expertise in, in, in the technology and SEO and stuff. But I would propose, I'd like to discuss with you this idea that it was your human side that formed the difference. Yeah, well, so I think what's really interesting there is I didn't have much expertise, right? I got into the field in late 2002, early 2003. You know, it was not that I was one of the best practitioners or all that very smart at it. It was only the, you know, we could call it the human side or the transparent side, the fact that I was sharing openly about yeah. what was working and what wasn't, about my mistakes, about uh, things that, you know, went well. Uh, about tactics that seem to get rankings, about how Google seemed to work. I think that sharing more so than you know expertise, especially in the early days, is what brought us customers. And then, of course, working with those customers, having success, getting that experience turned me into someone who you know had a lot of experience. But um, in the early days, it was the sharing, the open sharing in this world where everyone was keeping their mouth shut that helped. And this is a team for you, eh? The this is a, a theme for you, but it is a little, little bit. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and is it, I mean, what is, is that concept of transparency something that evolved from this really difficult scenario of the debt or have you always been like that or? 
because it is no. part of your offering that transparency yeah i think that um i think that actually my historic sort of you know experiences growing up and and into early adulthood uh were categorized or or, or were you know overwhelmed with a lot of a lot of secrecy and a lot of you know little lies here and there and then some big lies like like the debt which you can you can read about of course mm -hmm. um and i think that those experiences turned me off so much that i went completely the opposite direction right i just i just 180 and and became this person who you know has an incredible desire for and desire to create transparency and how do you think that has been received as in because there's some views that it's not good and there's other views that it is good yeah i think i think both are correct there are upsides and downsides to uh to almost any value and you know the reason that we have them is because we we believe that the good outweighs the bad and i certainly do uh mm -hmm. and i think a lot of people share that opinion and then there are those who who really don't so it's had positive effects you know certainly um it's been wonderful kind of on the on the marketing and the brand building side for Moz uh, historically, and I think on the helping people front, right, it's helped a lot of folks who learned SEO through the company and then became customers of the company. Uh, but it's also had some negatives. Uh, I wrote about in the book, you know, how we had uh, plenty of investors who, you know, would read my blog and they'd read about how I wrote about pitching and that sort of thing, and they'd say, look, we don't want anything to do with you, and I better not read about this on your blog. Um, so it has it has positives and negatives. But when that happens, how do you feel when that happens? Do you just uh, push it aside and say there we we will find the right match, and it's always to find the right match? And yeah, you have that's, faith that's that. Exactly that right. I think it's it's a self selecting bias that works tremendously in our favor, uh, okay. and this is also true for employees. Okay. I, I think that you know we've had plenty of employees over the years who've been somewhere between uncomfortable and very unhappy with my level of sharing, um, and I think that's actually a sign that probably we weren't a great fit. Well, what are they uncomfortable about? Uh, uncomfortable about sharing internal discussions, especially when there was contentious issues. Uh, uncomfortable with sharing, you know. Um, uh, missed dates or deadlines or mistakes that we've made, uh, especially when it was their team that they feel like got the blame for something. Uh, yeah, so that's been that's been a hard road. To you know, you you have this experience, I'm sure, right, where you work with you work with a contractor or you work with someone on your team, and they sort of let you down. And maybe you didn't describe things well, or maybe the project was set up for failure. Or maybe that you know, maybe there was some structural elements there that led to it. But also, those people should have known, and they should have informed you, and it shouldn't have gotten but to launch. I know game. also that there is a fear of, as an entre entrepreneur, that you keep this distance between you and the and an employee because you want them to stay, you want them to trust you, you want them to believe that you have it all taken care of, and that their job is safe. And so, for you to take a leap, because from employees you will hear the story of, no, we want to know. We want you to share with us when it's, you know, not good. But then then there are times when, because as part of my work, I will do, um, from a positioning context, I actually interview the employees as part of a brand positioning exercise because I often find that there's truth there that's yeah. not always apparent and it's a truth that should be shared. And so I would have heard mixed views on, I don't want to know, I just want my job to be safe. and the other view, which is, I want to know because I want to help you sort it. So mm -hmm. how do you decide? Uh, I, I mean, for me, the decision was transparency is a core value. Yeah. And that means okay. that we're going to take, we are willing to accept all of the negative ramifications and consequences of being transparent uh, in order to live up to this value. And then, and then I think your job is to prove that to people, right? It's to prove it to customers and to prove it to uh, your field and the people who, who watch you. It's to prove it to your employees and your investors and your shareholders. So, so this is also great. 
it also interests me when we are thinking about developing a product or a service or you know when we're offering something that that is possible because you speak so knowledgeably and passionately about this idea of transparency that in helping another entrepreneur isn't it possible then that who we are as a person is also the ingredient to our USP for our business, not just what we do. Yeah, I think that's absolutely the case, especially if um, who you are as a person is someone that um, that other people find compelling and interesting and, and, and valuable. Um, and I think, you know, my uh, there's a lot of ways to be that kind of person, but, you know, of course my favorites are, are being open and, and being kind and being kind that's really good okay <laughs> so okay i like this let's just poke at this again so kim scott you re reference in your book and this idea of radical candor not just transparency i, was gonna say, I thought i had her book on my shelf but i think it's no, i took notes <laughs> so she so you have this great uh, um graphic okay and it's this idea that it's not just about being honest, it's about being transparent, this radical candor. Yeah. To take it to that end, to that degree, that it's not just, because being honest gets you off the hook, but being transparent, no, it's a lot tougher, eh? Yeah, I think honesty is simply telling the truth. Transparency is digging into the, the how and the why and, and then, uh, exposing that fully, even the uncomfortable parts, the parts that you don't want to share, the parts that no one asked you about. Hey, no right. one asked for what yeah. were the really hard things about this project that didn't go well. We just said, how did it go? And I was just expecting the metrics. I wasn't expecting you to dig in and say, well, behind <laughs> the scenes, it's all this stuff. And that's the transparent part. Um, yeah. I think in, in Radical Candor, right, Kim discusses a lot of this idea that you are being um, forthright and honest with someone about their, uh, their progress and their feedback, but you're doing it in a, in a kind way, right? Mm -hmm. That you're presenting it uh, honestly, that you're not hiding anything, even if, even if a discussion, especially if the discussion is uncomfortable or hard to have, you're having it, uh, but you're never doing it in a way that attacks them personally or that is... Um, you know, feels ingenuous, disingenuous, or feels unfair. Do you think you're brave? Me personally? Yeah, with this this uh, value. Hmm. I mean, I feel like bravery is when you put put out something and you take a big risk. And I would say that my career has suggested to me that Lost and Founder, this book, would, would not be a particularly big risk. I think the only, well, the only uncomfortable risk that I probably cost myself, but I already cost myself, that was, was relationships with some of the leadership um, at my, you know, at, at Moz. Okay. Those bridges were a little burned already, so Lost and Founder was not going to, certainly not going to, you know, accelerate that. But brave in that... You took this view because of the debt, possibly, and all this and the history beforehand. But brave, some would say brave and some would say naive in some way. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll take both of those. Yeah, and, and I like that you're okay with that because I think that is inspiring. Because I think that is brave. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. I, definitely one of the things I hope to do with the book is to learn. I've never published you know, a, a book like this before. Um, I had no idea what the experience would be like, and, and so far, uh, it's it's been really extraordinary. I'm very thankful. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's wonderful, and I recommend it highly. Thank you. Okay, so let's move really quickly to um, your last day, and you have uh, last day at Moss, and mm -hmm. you mention on your last day, um, if you were to rate uh, it at zero, that you were being dragged out screaming or 10, zero out of 10, and the 10 would be that, you know, everyone loving you as you leave. And you rate it. And I was, it's funny, because as I read each word, I was waiting, and then I was shocked because you said four. Well, four is not terrible. It's almost five. You know? <laughs> yeah, okay. Almost right in the middle. It's closer to being dragged out screaming, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah, I would say, well, um, 
it was it was not a, a, a wholly positive experience, you know, certainly. Okay. I, I mean, this is a company, right, that uh, I've never worked anywhere else my whole adult life, right? This is a company that I, um, that I love and that I built and that I feel extremely close to. Um, and so to, to sort of lose it in this manner was, yeah, really. Can you explain that painful. to people, the losing it bit? So where, what has happened? For oh, sure. So, I, I mean, I talked about this very briefly in the, in the blog post, and I think I didn't get into it in the book, but, um, you know, I basically had some personal and professional conflicts with the leadership at Moz, and I think, you know, when, when that happens and you're not the CEO, you tend to be the person who leaves. Um, and so, yeah, uh, we, we sort of settled on some, some terms and I, um, and Moz was actually, you know, very generous to me with a, with a severance package. Um, okay. but yeah, I mean, that's a deep, you know, it's a, it's a hard reality and a, and a tough sadness. Yeah. So another thing that you mentioned, and one thing that I talk to people about a lot is this, as you grow a business, because you just mentioned the CEO thing. As you grow a business, one of the things I get people to do is to kind of draw this ladder and to understand where you are at each point. And one of the key learnings for me is, and for a business, is that you must be a different person at each stage because what it takes to take the business to the next stage is something fundamentally different than what it takes to start a business. And you actually allude to this in your book. And you talk about uh, the CEO and uh, vision and the CEO is not, sorry, the founder is not necessarily the person who can bring the vision to life. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting conundrum. So it, um, it does tend to be the case that the most successful uh, venture backed and um, bootstrapped technology companies are founder led, meaning that the, the, the founder or founders are still the um, the CEOs. I think you you know you could name one yeah, yeah. of a dozen any famous you know examples. It's almost always the founder and the, and the CEO. Um, but uh, that being said, I think that you know in in the case uh, in many cases where the CEO is replaced. Um, there's a sense from the investors or the board of directors that maybe the CEO doesn't have the ability to take the company to where it needs to go in, in terms of growth or management or leadership. Um, in, in my case, that that is not exactly what happened. So I, um, I voluntarily stepped down. I told my board of directors that I wanted to no longer be CEO and that I wanted to promote my, my longtime chief operating officer, Sarah, to the role. Um, and I did that because I was at the time, and I wrote about this in the book. I know. Um, at the time, you know, was was depressed, had depression, and um, and felt and knew that that was negatively affecting the company and a lot of my executive team and um, and the people around me, and that it was an unhealthy dynamic. Uh, and and I think I hoped as well that I could um, overcome this, you know, this this huge sort of life overwhelming problem by stepping back. Um, and my board of directors was very supportive. You know, Brad said, hey, if this is a change you want to make, we can make it, you know, we can make it really soon. And, and so we, I think we decided, we talked in late 2013 and we made the change in early 2014. Um, and it what was you not, What you yeah. mentioned about was also that you were no longer doing the things that you loved. Yeah, I think that is that is definitely true, and that had been true for a long time. Um, but I think that that's something I'm relatively comfortable with. Spark Toro is a great example. You, know, you mentioned uh, when we started the call, like, oh, I've been doing this for three months now. Gosh, does it, has it really been that long? And I realized I haven't done, I've barely done any of the work that I love. Most of the work is you know, setting up taxes, accounting, payroll, you know, finance, finding a good attorney, getting all the trademarks. I don't like any of that stuff. None of that is fun for me, but that has been literally, you know, 90% of my work has been whatever operations and setup work for the last, you know, 85 days. Yeah. Um, but there you go. Okay. So what is your relationship now? Because I saw that you have a, you had a whiteboard Friday for Moz today. So what is your relationship now with Moz? Yeah, I was, I sort of wondered about that. So I filmed, I think I filmed maybe nine or 10 mm. 
you know, whiteboard Fridays before I left and I, with, with the marketing team and just said like, hey, when, whenever you wanna publish these. So I didn't actually know that this one was coming out today. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm still, so I'm still the chair of the board, uh, mm -hmm. chairman of the board of directors at Moz. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, I think my wife and I are jointly the largest shareholder, largest mm -hmm. single shareholder at the company. We own just about 24% of that company. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then I also, um, yeah, occasionally will contribute for them. I, I was working on a project, a product for a long time, even after I left called Link Explorer that mm -hmm. came out just a couple weeks ago. And um, yeah, really enjoyed working so with that team. Very, you're still very connected to this thing that you created or this entity that you created. Yeah, in certain ways. Uh, now the Lincoln Explorer is out. I think, you know, I asked them if they wanted me to still be part of it, and I sort of got a non-response. So I don't think I'm invited to those meetings anymore, which is fine. Uh, I have plenty of other work to do. But um, yeah, it's been yeah, it's been a sort of mostly organic disconnect. But there's uh, still obviously some elements that are connected. Okay, so I see that there are a couple of questions, so we might just have a look, okay? So, one is from, um, uh, I can't pronounce, my apologies, uh, Mare uh, from, Ciao from Italy. I founded a company thanks to Shark Tank Italy, but once we opened the company, what was agreed with the sharks never happened and I was left alone. Uh, mm. When should you give up is things are not moving as they should. I would lose everything despite having 90%. Yeah, I mean, I think that... Uh that is a tough call, but a lot of a lot of the entrepreneurs that I have talked to and that I know um, have actually felt better after they make the decision to give up on something that's not working, so that they can go pursue something new. And I think one of the wonderful things that is absolutely true it's it's really tough to leave behind something and to say this didn't work out, but you have to know you are not alone. Uh, something like 85, 90 percent of tech companies don't return the money that they you know that they that they need to to their investors or their um, their shareholders, uh, and so you should feel fine about that. I wouldn't worry. You're in a you're in a basket with a ton of great people. Uh, and the second thing I would say is that you've learned a tremendous amount, right? This this experience of starting a company that failed that didn't work has almost certainly taught you an incredible amount that you now get to go apply to the next company. And so I wouldn't feel too terrible about giving up on something and saying, hey, you know what, I don't think this, whatever it is, market, product, positioning, uh, approach is the right one, we should go do something else. And she says, thank you so much, I learned a lot, and thanks also for your book. So, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, what I'd like to also, maybe to bring on along with this one, as we speak about failure, because the, I think in some ways in Ireland, we're a little bit jealous of America because failure mm. is embraced as part of the journey. And here, there is a lot of shame and hiding around this whole concept of failure. It's not equated with learning, it's equated with failure. Failure is equated with failure. Well, you know, uh, the United States does um, a tremendous number of things really wrong. Um, and, and there are, you know, the list of things that I am, um, jealous of, of Ireland and of many European countries about is, is so long, but I do think, I do think from an entrepreneurial standpoint, this, this cultural comfort that, that Americans have with, with failure and with trying again and, you know, with falling down and getting back up, I think that probably more than most anything else contributes to the you know the entrepreneur culture um, and the successes that that have happened in the country and so i certainly urge i urge folks even people who are not entrepreneurs to try and adopt that to try and say oh did you did you fail once and then and then you tried it again bravo we um, are so proud of you right and we support you uh and i think i think doing that i think doing that no matter whether it's an entrepreneurial venture or whether it's you know a failed relationship or um, a failed, uh, you know, job interview, or you know, a failed attempt at at making great brisket, whatever it is, right? It, it, there's a wonderful, wonderful thing that says, "Hey, we've all been there. We accept your failures. Don't worry about it. You learned. You're gonna make make it, you know, great next time." We'll have to learn that, Rand, because 
there are a few people was who will there it's it's not in our dna hmm. so we will have can, to learn that we're good at learning by the way <laughs> i mean you know yeah. for americans apparently it's in our dna to kill school children with guns every week okay. or two so <laughs> I, you know, that's something that we can't seem to get out of our DNA, and it's yeah. clearly much more unhealthy. Yeah. So, uh, you know, okay. we'll all work on it. In that context. Um, okay, so this idea of bravo, you failed. Okay, this is one, we'll walk away with that one. Okay, so, great. I want to do really quickly, because I know I want to move you on. So, you mentioned the, why the startup world hates uh, services business and why you shouldn't. So, yeah. and I remember myself um, we going to funding agencies here about developing a product uh, and there is a complete reticence and it's definitely born also in Silicon Valley. There's a complete reticence towards services businesses, absolute reticence. And you, uh, in this, in your book, you've also, you've done some numbers first. And this is the other thing I like about you. You actually bring the numbers and the patterns into reality. So. Um, talk to us about that services versus products also even funding in this country is is not for services businesses yeah and I think that's true in, in the United States as well um, there's there's almost no funding for for services businesses but the beautiful thing about services is mm -hmm. if you do it right it self funds right you don't you, you don't need an office you don't need to hire anybody you're the consultant, right? And you go out and do the work and you make the money. And then if you want, you can hire, a, you know, hire another person and bring them on and, and everyone sort of pays for themselves with the work that they do. So services businesses often don't need a big upfront investment. And the beautiful part about a services business is it provides a lot of value. There are a lot of people who desperately need that help. Uh, you learn a tremendous amount as a services business. And, and that can be you know, if you want, that can be used in the future to build product. Um, and I think a lot of great B2B, especially a lot of great product ideas come from, you know, repetitive manual work that's done over and over um, as part of consulting. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing that I would say is that in a services businesses, most of the time, the partner or partners who start it own 100% of that business because mm. there's no investors. Mm. And they also own their future. If they want to, hey, we're making a lot of profit this year. Well, why don't we pay ourselves more? They can do that. Uh, hey, this thing is, uh, is growing a lot. Why don't we, why don't we invest in growth and, uh, and then we can sell it. And when you sell it, you get 100% of those sales. Yeah. Right? In a lot of investor-backed situations, you might say, oh, hey, we're grown like a weed. We have an offer to sell for $10 million. Oh, but we raised $4 million at a 2x preference. So the investors, if we sell for 10, the investors get $8 million, and then they get their percentage of the company, which is 30%. So they're going to get, you know, $8.7 million, and we're going to get, you know, $1.3 to split between us. That That's not particularly appealing. You know, I make... Uh, you know, a quarter of that every year. Why would I? Why would I sell up for that? So, really, really different sorts of equations um, and considerations. And product is not, you know, not this beautiful savior. It's just what uh, what investors like to see because that's where they tend to make money. Well, I like this that you're bringing people's awareness to these facts. You know what I mean? Because often. Again, you hear this all the time uh, as an entrepreneur, you're working all, mostly in your business instead of on your business and try to get to think about being on your business and this idea of, you also go in about this in, your, in one of your chapters, beware of the pivot, this idea of choosing wisely at the start and even thinking, thinking from the very beginning of where you want to take the business. So not meander, not allowing the market or customers or outside influence to dictate your path that you can choose the path now especially because of uh, the fact that people have been there before and entrepreneurs do share we do share as you said sometimes over alcohol <laughs> or coffee or, yeah whatever it is right okay so again um, tell me a little bit more about the beware of the pivot so you sure. said it's more important to get started. This is, and you have an expletive, but anyway, it's a commonly used 
phrase that it's more important to get started than spend months evaluating and choosing a wiser path. And you say no. No. Uh, so I, I think that the, the fundamental thing that this idea of just get started, just get started, I think this is a very American cultural attitude of, you know, hey, look, it's not about the idea. Uh, ideas are nothing. Execution is everything. Yeah. And that's crazy. I, I don't even know who came up with this, but it, it is just my num numbingly dumb. Um, I, well, it's this idea of perfectionism, this fear of perfectionism, of waiting until something, a human, the human thing of, I want it to be just right. But it's never just right. So uh, certainly there's a balance, right? I think, I think you, yeah. you could spend you know, years evaluating something and then be like, oh, I'm not sure if I want to jump in. And maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe you need to take the leap. But this idea of just dive in, doesn't matter what field you're in, doesn't matter what your idea is. No, it matters a tremendous amount what your idea is. And choosing a field that is underserved versus one that's incredibly competitive, or choosing a field where you have unique knowledge and value and a great network already versus one where you have no network at all and you don't know a single person who does the thing that you're going to be uh, you know, trying to build products for. That's, that is really strange to me because then the advice immediately after that, once you start, is do you have a big market? Do you have a unique value proposition? Uh, do you have some, some competitive advantage? Uh, how are you going to scale? How are you going to get a low cost of customer acquisition? All, all these things that imply that you should have had these built into your idea. But let me ask you a question, okay? Because you have hindsight now. I mean, I'm in complete agreement with you on this, okay? Because my, what I do is, I work is, my work is about strategy. So I'm in complete agreement with you. But I know the nature of the entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And I want you to cast your mind back to when you started. And that frantic time when you were do, 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 and head down to get things done. How would you, do you remember that? Do you remember, were you strategic in, and were you wise then? Well, I think that uh, accidentally, yes. Okay. Right? So, You're a new yeah, in, in a way, right? we, we picked a market that was growing uh, rapidly, that was underserved, where we could provide unique value. And I think that, you know, we, we didn't see it that way. We didn't, you know, I wish I could have read that chapter in my book, in my own book, and, and, and sort of had this, oh, I should think about it this way, and I should consider these things. But instead, we just went with it because, there were paying customers there and there were no paying customers in the other place. Okay. Um, but that and being before, said, I think before even the debt had occurred, would you say in your nature then, were you, were you like so many entrepreneurs, which is the head down and just doing, or were you wise enough to take a step back and look, okay, great. So no, my God, I was in my twenties. I mean, you know, just everything, all the mistakes possible. Uh, the one thing I want to add on this is just that, um, when you start a business, mm. your idea tends not to improve, at least not very much, right? The, the, the thing that you're doing, whatever you're building, the market you're serving, what you're trying to build, you, you refine it and, and get better, certainly. But um, execution, your ability to you know, execute on that, on that roadmap to get better at marketing and sales and operations and product creation and all these things, that improves dramatically. So. Execution is something where I think you can start low, but if your idea is great, you will, you know, you will be carried forward on the strength of that idea. Okay. If, however, you start with a bad idea, you could get great at execution and still not, not end up anywhere. And that's where, that's where a lot of startups, uh, certainly you know, a lot of tech, tech startups in the US, I think that their fundamental idea just isn't, isn't that great, but they got started. Okay, so idea and kind of positioning first. So, which leads me to my question around the lovely term from the US also, and much embraced everywhere, much, much embraced everywhere. In the building that I'm in, Rand, it's a tech and innovation building. So the whole idea of MVP is bleh, everywhere, right? Minimum viable product, okay? Yeah. Your thoughts. What Sorry, are your thoughts? Your thoughts. Oh, what are my thoughts? I mean, it's a big uh, so, what we're talking about, but I'd yeah. like to talk about so it. So for, for a very early stage company, one that bar you know, barely exists or doesn't exist yet, I think the MVP model works beautifully. 
-hmm. right? You, you build something that, that's barely functional, that's just sort of the smallest version of what's still useful and usable, and then you share that with a lot of people who are potential customers, and you get feedback, and then you iterate. I think that works fine. Um, in fact, I think that's, that's a really beautiful way to go. Mm. Where it breaks down, where I think it's a terrible idea, is when you have a large market already, or a lot of people paying attention to you. And some early stage companies do, right, Be, by virtue of, you know, maybe their founders are very well known, or they receive money from this, this place, or they have, you know, they have the attention of a lot of people already, um, or they just built a huge marketing list before they, you know, uh, went out to market. And if you launch an MVP to, in those cases, or in a later stage when you have a lot of people paying attention to you, it can be disastrous. Okay. Disastrous because nobody, you know, nobody gets a first version of a product and says, oh, well, this is pretty crappy um, and I don't really like it, but I can imagine that in the future when it gets much better, it'll be a really interesting, useful product. No one ever thinks that way. No consumer, no, no buyer of a product ever thinks that way. Instead, they think, this is crappy. This company must be crappy. They make terrible things. Not interested. Next. Right? You really burn your reputation by launching MVPs and then iterating and learning rather than privately, you know, keeping that quiet, right, and, and doing the private beta thing, which is sort of like what early stage companies do where you show it individually to a number of people and you get their feedback and then you iterate until those people are saying, wow, this is incredible. This is exceptional and I can't live without it. When is it available? You know, I want to tell all my friends about it. Okay, now launch that your results will be much, much, much better. And so that's why I argue for the exceptional viable product, the EVP over the MVP. Excellent. Okay. So this is what we've been talking about are some of the issues that, and some of the things that you've shared wonderfully in your wonderful book. I give you the plug, right? Lost and Founder. And I'm really enjoying it because it's such a nice, it's an easy read. You write as you speak. Oh, thanks. Which yeah. Really nice. So then, okay. So, and I wish you every best for this. I want to talk now about Spark Toro. And I know that you've written a blog post about also because my um, love in marketing, my market, my love is marketing, but one of the areas of marketing that I love most is brand. So mm -hmm. you decided to call your new business Spark Toro. Tell us about that. Oh, sure. Uh, you mean specifically about the name? Yeah, well, tell us you started the business because I also I think it's interesting where you progress to because you have done again, you've identified an emerging market that is very, very interesting. It's also interesting in the context today of GDPR and things like, because I think this area is, is going to explode. You picked perfectly. Um, mm. So let's talk about this because it's the area of influencer, audience insights, influencer marketing, all of this area. So tell us first about the business, and I'd sure. like to share with the idea of the brand. Yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, basic, the basic thing that we kept seeing, my, my co-founder Casey and I, we kept observing lots and lots of folks, especially entrepreneurs and startups, but marketing teams as well, is that um, you know, if, you, if you were creating a product that lots of people were already searching for, then you could go ahead and do SEO and rank well in Google and that would help you grow. But if no one was searching for the product that you created or the service that you created because it was very new or because people just didn't know to look for it um, or because search wasn't the path, you instead had to go find who, who is my audience for this product and where do they hang out, right? Who do they pay attention to? What events do they go to? What, you know, what podcasts do they listen to, what webinars do they attend, what email lists are they on, uh, who do they follow, right, what publications do they read, all those kinds of things. And then you go try and do your marketing there, right? Mm -hmm. And for, uh, you know, for a lot of startups, that's just, oh, well, I guess I'll buy some Facebook ads and, and maybe, you know, some ads on LinkedIn or whatever it is. Um, but getting in front of your audience organically can be extraordinarily powerful. Mm -hmm. And the, the big problem that we kept seeing is that a lot of these companies were paying a PR firm to go do this, or they were, you know, running a big research survey or something that could cost twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars 
to get just to get back a list of here's where your audience hangs out, right? Here's who they pay attention to. Um, here's the publications they read. Here's the events they go to. And we thought this, and, and a lot of the agencies, we talked to a ton of the agencies who do that work, and it's slow and manual work that they're, you know, they're just Googling around and, and trying to find all these things and go to these networks. Um, and we thought technology should, should solve this. You should be able to type in, you know, I want interior designers on the West Coast of the United States and get back a, okay, here's what they read and listen to and go to and pay attention to. And then you can, you know, select the ones that you want and build your list and send that to your client or use that internally for your marketing purposes. It shouldn't be tens of thousands of dollars and it shouldn't be weeks of work. And it's interesting because, I mean, I've been doing uh, marketing consulting and working with clients for 25 years. And I can say without exception that in every case of every client I've ever worked with, no matter what stage they are at and what degree of success they've had, they don't know enough about their customers. We think we know enough about our customers. We think we know our customers. We often, um, we often ignore data because it's probably not interesting or painful to go through or know where to search. It or, doesn't match our preconceived notions. Yes, because we think we're our customer, where in fact <sighs> that might have been just the idea when we're in our garden shed thinking about it. But when we move outside, of, open the door and go, hello world, the world is different. So this is, this is wonderful that you're doing this. Um, what is it going to look like, Rand? Uh, so we're still six to nine months away from having yeah, even that private beta product. Uh, yeah. So I don't know exactly, okay. but I, I, I suspect it will function probably a lot like a, you know, a search engine, right? There'll be a, a box where you can put in you know, keywords to go after an audience, or you could say, well, I can't quite describe exactly who my audience is, but I know that a lot of them follow this person or a lot of them pay attention to this website. And so you could give us that information or you might say, you know what? I can't really describe them, but here, here are a hundred of them. Right? And you could send us maybe a hundred um, email addresses or a hundred Twitter accounts and we could find lots of people who are like those people and then go figure out sort of like you do on Facebook mm. with Facebook ads. Yeah, um, yeah. Where you say, I want, I want a lookalike audience of these people. And then we'd go, we can go and, out and, and find So them. you're thinking that it, so taking that idea of the lookalike audiences and stuff, but that it's not confined to Facebook. <laughs> yeah, because Facebook is insanely frustrating. They have all this, you know, incredible amount of data about it, but they're not going to share anything other than, yes, would you, how much would you like to bid on, on advertising to reach these people? So in light of that, because this is about data and we're on data day here with the GDPR and, um, mm -hmm. and I mean, there's a couple of things that are interesting. You brought up about influencer marketing, but this whole idea of data and the privacy of people, people's privacy, this is an absolute something that influences what you're doing, actually. Yeah, we're not, um, we're not entirely sure to what extent it will directly impact what we're doing, but I think that um, it, it, it will impact the market in such a way that potentially the, the value that we can provide becomes greater because people just need some alternatives. Um, I think, you know, my, my feelings on GDPR, are, um, I think there are a few small good elements of it that actually provide some protection, right? The ability to, you know, request that a company, hey, what information do you have about me? And can you please delete all that information? I think that's great. Um, a lot of the other, you know, protections, unfortunately, are mostly going to protect Facebook and Google's monopoly over online advertising by preventing anyone else from being able to get into the field um, because no one else can get the permissions and, the, and store the personally identifiable information and use that in the ways that those companies will be able to. And they've sort of been able to gain so much and grow so much that they're going to consolidate their monopoly power thanks to this law. And I, I think that was probably not unintentional, right? They, I mean, they had what, like hundreds of lobbyists and then research organizations who are all influencing the European Union regulators, um, you know, and pitching them about, oh, well, you should structure it this way. You should write the law this way. Don't write it this way, write it this other way. And, and they ended up being very successful with that. So I think, unfortunately, I was, I was surprised to see the EU regulators 
falling prey to the same thing that we fall prey to here in the United States, which is sort of these, these big companies um, getting exactly what they want. Uh, maybe not exactly, but... No, I, I mean, I also like to, I'd also like to view it that it's um, re-instructing businesses to nurture relationships with customers mm. instead of shortcutting. There's too much... What is, I am asked this all of the time, what is the formula, Fanola? What is the formula? And I'm like, the formula is you, your customer will teach you the formula of how to speak to them because they will share with you how they want to be spoken to. If they are not listening, then you, I mean, this is, will allow you to stop and mindlessly shove in a landing page, an email, an offer. It's this offer, this offer, this offer, but actually craft something that resonates with the customer of what they need at each point in that funnel. It's the so truer, I think, yeah. a truer relationship. I, I think I would love that. I, that sounds amazing and awesome. And I would be a hundred percent behind that. I, um, I think I'm very cynical and skeptical that GDPR will actually do that. I think, I think maybe it will do that for some of the smaller companies. Yeah. Right, that it'll for, force a little bit, uh, some of that thinking, but I think in fact it will, um, it won't do any of that for the larger companies who have the power, right, the, the legal power and the, you know, armies of lawyers and the, um, and the ability to circumvent or, or find the loopholes in a lot of these rules and work around them. Um, and then, and that those big companies, especially the, the big advertising players, right, Facebook and Google, will essentially just go to small companies and say, oh, you know, this is too hard to do yourself. Just pay us. Just pay us. And a lot of companies will. Um, a lot of companies already do. So I, I don't know. Yeah, like no, I said, I there's, some, there's a couple of good things with GDPR, but it's, yeah. Hmm. I'd like to think that with developments like this, that we're starting to become more aware, and we have become a bit more aware of how we've been manipulated and our data has been manipulated. Yeah, I, so there's definitely, I think there's an element of GDPR that has come about because people have this sense that they're being manipulated online. Yeah. Um, and I think the, the frustrating part is that there are laws that could have been written to actually address that, and the, this is not that law, right? This law does not prevent um, a lot of the manipulation and abuse. I think it makes it a little bit harder and mm. it requires a little more legal hoop jumping through, but mm. um, I, don't, I don't foresee it preventing um, the manipulation that, that we've all been you know, worried about. Well, and maybe there's no way to do that, right? Maybe the way to do that yeah, is not through legal means, it's you know, all of us getting our consciousness up about it. I mean, you are, you are the proponent of transparency. I mean, this is another Absolutely. piece of transparency and I will be the naive one in this conversation and the hope uh, one in this conversation. No, because we I both want the same thing. We both yeah, are hoping. I, I we both like are hoping to, for the same thing. I'd like to think this is a step forward and laws can ultimately be changed and improved. And if yeah. we start to think a little differently, we will get closer. So I, I hope I, so. Yeah. So I'm going to, what I would like to do, what I would like to ask you one final thing, because you've been so gracious with your time. Oh, of course, my pleasure. <laughs> is if you were to give, this is the usual question, but I'd like to ask it. If you were to give three pieces of advice to an entrepreneur, what would you share with them now? Yeah, so I would say, I think one of the best things that you can do as an entrepreneur is to have, um, to spend real time on self-awareness and to try and understand your own motivations. Why are you building a business? Why are you an entrepreneur? Are you on this track because you started down it and now the boulder's rolling down the hill and you're not sure where it's going and it just feels like you gotta keep getting up every day and doing that. And, and sometimes, you know, maybe that is because of whatever obligations you have, you, you have to keep doing that, but at least recognize it and know it to yourself and know whether you want freedom from that at some point. Um, okay. Know why you're building what you're building. And if you can if you can dig deeply into that, I think uh, that can that can truly truly help you. I, for you know, for myself, for example, I know that I feel an incredible um, obligation to prove some people wrong about me, and to prove to myself 
probably more importantly, to prove to myself that I can do this again. That I, you know, that, that it wasn't just a one-time fluke and that, you know, that I've learned something and that I can, can apply that knowledge. Um, you will. Second, second piece of advice, well, we'll see. <laughs> Fingers crossed. I believe. Uh, second piece of advice for you is um, I think that it can really pay to uh, figure out the intersection of three, sort of three things uh, when you are going out and trying to do you know, marketing for your startup and, and get, get customers. And that is, um, where can I provide unique value? Mm -hmm. Not just where can I provide value, but unique value. I can do things differently that are in this arena that is more valuable than what anyone else is doing in that arena. Uh, where do I have personal passion and interest, mm -hmm. right? So if, um, you know, if you think to yourself, God, I really, God, I really hate Instagram. I just, you know, I hate the social network and I'm not into the, you know, the, these photos and blah, blah, blah. Okay, don't make that your primary form of marketing. Even if someone told you, oh, there's a lot of customer development you do on Instagram, you are not gonna be great at, at building a marketing practice and attracting customers in a field or, or in, through a system that you personally dislike. So don't, don't do that. Uh, find one that you like. And then the third intersection is make sure it's a place where your customers actually are. Right? So choose an area where your customers are, where you have personal passion and interest, and where you can provide unique value. If you find the, you know, the overlap of those three points, you tend to do a great job with, uh, with customer attraction. Fantastic. Third piece, final one, um, is pretty simple. If everyone is doing something one way, or if the prevailing culture around startups and, and, and you know, whatever field you're in is telling you to do something one way, I think it pays almost always to question that and consider whether you should choose an alternative. I know a lot of people who say, oh, well, you should follow the best practices. If there is a best practices, you should question it. Maybe you should follow it, but you should absolutely question it. That's a great, great one. It's a, a guy called Martin Neumeyer, who you may know of. Um, it's when they zig, you zag. Yeah, I, and I, you know, I wouldn't be quite that. Better. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be quite that um, contrarian, but yeah. I would definitely say there's there's value in questioning. Yeah, I would agree. Thank you for your time, Randy. It's been wonderful oh. and a pleasure. And best yeah. of all. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. <laughs> great. Take care. Have a great day. Yeah, yeah bye you bye. too.